our next speaker who is uh, Karen um, uh, would throw some light on this because like she said, she's been, you know, her organization has been working um, in a mix of rural and urban areas and even tribal areas. So Karen is uh, the managing trustee for Rice in Affinity Foundation, uh, which is our partner uh, for this um, webinar. Chief Impact Officer and MD for IDOBRO Impact Solutions and heads the Secretariat for MahaPikonet. MahaPikonet is actually a coalition of over 65 development of partner organizations convened by UNICEF Maharashtra as a unified COVID response, uh, a response to COVID. And with a focus on vulnerable groups across uh, the rural and tribal areas of the state and Maharashtra is a, one of the biggest states in the country. They've launched a project called Comark, and through this project, uh, they've uh, reached out to over 33 lakh people in uh, six districts, uh, covering 25, over 25 blocks, uh, 323 gram panchayats, and over 350 villages in the state. Wow. Um, so Karen, uh, our first question to you is, what are the biggest factors causing vaccine uh, resistance in rural India, and especially you've covered, you know, more than 350 villages in such a huge, diverse state. It'll be great to hear your perspective. Over to you. Thank you, Priyanka. Yes, indeed. Um, I think this was a very ambitious, if, if I might even say the most ambitious we have done to date, uh, because we look to cover uh, six districts, uh, uh, you know, and um, 323 gram panchayat, which are the local uh, government uh, bodies and then finally about 350 villages, um, which would be about 300,000 people directly, uh, physically, and then online, of course, we were looking at more than double that number. Uh, so it was really an ambitious one in a short time frame, I might add, of just, you know, four months time. So it was very ambitious, but we thought it was very, very critical and we had to give it a shot. Uh, I'm happy to say that we're coming to the end of that particular project, which is, um, uh, and we have met our you know, targets, but what it has done more than meeting our targets, it has brought out so clearly, so clearly the vaccine hesitancy and vaccine resistant pockets. Because we went all out, we were actually able to identify those areas where they are just not willing to do. And so the next part of this is because we've got so many partners working on the ground with this project, we have seven of them. Uh, we have actually worked on it as how do we go forward and identify each of these and work on them in a very, very you know, focused manner because that's the only way we are going to be able to make any change happen uh, since they are absolutely you know, uh, refusing to take the vaccination. Um, Obviously, uh, reaching out to 300,000 people was not, not a simple task, right? To get the vaccination, look at cab behavior, etc. cetera. Um, and that required a lot of planning and also innovation, creativity. It's not enough. When somebody doesn't believe you, you can't go and tell them, look, I'll show you facts, I'll show you figures, I'll show you, uh, you know, you can do what you like, you know, like they say, if you... If you tell someone about God and they want to believe you, they will believe no, and no evidence is required. And if somebody, uh, what you call it, uh, doesn't want to believe, they will, no matter what you say, they're never going to believe, right? So it's simply the same kind of things, right? Um, and so uh, also uh, to be fair and, you know, to, sometimes you need to understand people from where they come from and that helps you deal with them better. So I think you also have to be fair in understanding that the situation is extremely complex, right, right now. It's very complex, complicated, uncertain, you know, uh, you have so many divergent views, there's so much of conspiracy theories going on, there is so much of misinformation that is being spread, even hate and fake news, right? So people don't know what to make out of it. So you need to approach this with a sense of empathy rather than going with a sense of saying, you know, oh, how can you not do it? Don't you understand this is the solution to the, to the world's problems, right? Um, well, we all know there are many, many solutions in the world. Doesn't mean we all accept every solution in our lives. Do we? We don't, right? Um, so if we, if we can do the wrong things in our lives, uh, just because it's not convenient for us or whatever, take the, take the simple thing about plastic, right? We keep talking about how plastic is destroying our planet and yet we all use it, you know? 
so why so therefore i'm just saying from a point of view it's not justified but it's being empathetic towards you know people who are vaccine hesitant and therefore we need to work with them with that attitude and then take them and that's how we did that right so one is the empathy and then two was being innovative so we use a lot of creative methods you know uh, skits uh, use i mean mascots you know use influencers all kinds of ways because we know as as that showed in the in the report that uh, really going with research and facts and figures are not going to work not not going to cut it you have to go with people who would by word of mouth convince people like look i got vaccinated you need to get vaccinated too i am safe you'll be safe too and i will not be safe if you are not safe so when you go with those kind of messaging i think it's very personal it's very believable it's very relatable and then that's what changes you know like i said a little while earlier when before we started our call that i think vaccine hesitancy and resistance is a real real case study in human psychology and behavior so i think it requires a lot of thought process before you can expect to get complete uh, acceptance and yeah that that i would say would be a starting point thanks a lot karen so uh, i know that you work in you know a mix of rural tribal and urban areas especially in the tribal areas and it's different in different states but a lot of tribal areas in india are very hard to access also and we know that it doesn't need to be only mountainous region but they are hard to access and sometimes they are slightly isolated so how is your organization uh, you know addressing vaccine hesitancy with tri- in tribal areas well all credit to our partners as i said you know we've got seven partners who are working with us on the ground and uh, all credit to them and to our volunteers who are working again community workers and i think that's the other thing right any kind of solution and and it's not only in disasters and it's not only in in crisis situation but even in development if it is participatory you know the chances of your success is far greater and so that was one thing right from day one that we were very clear that our entire work would be done through community workers you know you can't be an outsider going in telling people what to do right and they know those areas better they know those pockets which are unreachable they know you know how to get there when there is no other means according to us to really reach there right so they understand that terrain much much better than what we would do and so that's how we worked you know we 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 combined our strengths and our resources to be able to do this you know so they have their strengths we have our strengths and together i think we may, we multiply our impact and, and get better reach yeah. absolutely my last question uh so we you've already told us about the success and even in your intro you know i spoke about that the project is highly successful because to even have this kind of outreach it's amazing but from your and i'm sure there are there've been many failures because uh you must have found so many obstacles especially in this work and especially working throughout the pandemic in the field it's very difficult but if i have to ask you from your perspective one success one failure one lesson from this project what it would be um okay so if we're going to talk about vaccination specifically i think uh, was about a case where it was a single covid case okay in a village and uh, obviously all the other villagers were very very scared and worried but because of the way we worked with the entire village the way our uh, you know uh, volunteers okay went and the asha worker together so you have you know the asha workers you know so they all went together to counsel the person that look you have to be positive you got covid you'll recover you have to be positive you have to take care of yourself you have to take your medicines so they kept counseling that person and made them made them very positive on the other hand they also counseled the rest of the village that you know don't ostracize him don't don't make it seem like as though you know uh, he has done something wrong right it is it has happened right now whatever reason it has happened we all need to solve this together and make it make it happen and that led to you know not a single other person getting over the net village and i think that's a that's a great example of how to be resilient see it is if you don't allow preventive prevention is always better than cure there is no two ways about that right 
But should you have a problem, how you react to it, how you handle it, how you manage it, I think is a bigger, bigger story to be told and narrative that is very important to be replicated. And I think that would be one of my, in that case. Um, failure, death. Um, and it's very difficult to talk about it. But yeah, we've lost people, right? I mean, uh, and yes, those are the failures that we could not prevent. Uh, what was the third one? Lesson learned. Oh my God, so many. <laughs> Where do I start? That's um, my one, you know, which, uh, as per you, like one top lesson, like first lesson which comes to you. Support the supporters. Yeah. Uh, I don't think any of us can ever work alone, right? To achieve the impact you want to achieve. And if that's the case, it simply means that we need others. And when we need others, you need to be able to acknowledge that, you need to be able to recognize that, you need to be able to support that. And unfortunately, most of our community workers lay down their lives, literally get into risky situations without really getting a safety net because most of them are not formally engaged with any NGO or any institution. And yet they come forward, volunteer, you know, willingly, selflessly, you know, to kind of make sure that their villages are safe, their uh, cities are safe. And we need to really make sure that this gets taken care of. And that was one of the things that we really championed in the sense of every government meeting at every, every platform we possibly could get, that we need to, at the very least, is ensure, provide insurance to our volunteers. And and in most cases, NGOs cannot afford to do it because you can only get a, a, a what you call it, single um, insurance policy. You cannot get a group policy because they're not a, not a group, so to speak, not a formal group, not a formal employee. So there are many challenges and it took us six months of negotiating uh, and doing a lot of follow-up before we could finally get something that would help us to uh, insure our volunteers. And we, we've done, covered about almost 4,000 of them. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a great, uh, you know, download for me because uh, we keep reading about these things, but, you know, knowing about such a successful project for me, it's a big success. Uh, I have been so fortunate that I've been working from home throughout, maybe went out for four meetings that too, you know, I could decide where I have to sit, which place I will choose. So, you know, your organizations actually going out in the field and all your partner organizations working with all of them. It's just amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, Priyanka, if I, you don't mind, I just want to maybe add one. Sure. Line. And I think, you know, to really, uh, you know, pull off a project like this or to really pull off an intervention, like, because it's not just about a project, right? It's about something that can change people's life. I think you need the vision, uh, you know, uh, vision firstly of what you want to achieve, you know, how you're going to do it the response of the partner. So the vision of the donor or the supporter, which in this case was UNICEF, the response of the partners to immediately say, yes, we can do it. I mean, at the beginning, none of us thought we could do it. Honestly, we kept thinking and talking to UNICEF and saying, you know, these numbers are just unimaginable. But the partner said, yes, we will do it. You know, and, and, and I think that's the responsiveness of them. And third is the patience. I think, you know, and maybe that's the only role we played that, you know, we had the patience to wait it out and work with everybody and kind of, you know, make, and we come together and do it. And I think that's what you need at the end of the day to make that change. And hopefully that's what it's going to take us to get the remaining people vaccinated, uh, you know. In yeah. our Basically not giving up at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much.